Uh, thank you. You all seem to be ready. So the next item of business is a debate on motion 2065 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on drugs and alcohol preventing and reducing harm. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to move the motion. Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. November 2018 saw the publication of two key strategy documents aimed at reducing harm associated with alcohol and other drugs rights, respect and recovery, and our alcohol framework. A year on, there is much we can reflect on, learn from, and also celebrate. However, we can also agree that there is much that we as a country still need to do, reducing problematic drug and alcohol use, and the associated harms and deaths remain one of the most difficult and challenging issues we face. Levels of alcohol-related harm remain far too high. In 2018, Adults in Scotland drank an average of 19 units per adult um, per week, some 36% more than the low list guidelines of 14 units per week. There were 1,136 alcohol-specific deaths in 2018, an average of 22 every week. On drugs, the story is even more stark. 2018 saw the highest level of drug-related deaths ever recorded. And I've stated on numerous occasions that each and every one of these tragic deaths is ultimately avoidable. We've also seen significant rises in the levels of hospital stays related to drug use, while alcohol administration remains at similar levels to those seen in 2017-18. I'm going to make some progress, but I will come back to the member. Tackling the, the harms has, has to include addressing the underlying reasons for these addictions. We've previously focused too much on addressing the substances instead of the individual. Going forward, we must be more person-centered in all approaches to treatment. But there are contributory factors which remain out with an individual's control. We know that people who experience socioeconomic disadvantage experience problematic use. The recent burden of disease study found the overall burden for drug use disorder was 17 times higher in deprived areas. Both our strategies identified that tackling poverty and inequality is central to reducing harmful use of alcohol and drugs. Suffering adverse childhood experiences significantly increases the likelihood of lifetime illicit drug use and depend drug dependency, while also increasing the chances of early alcohol use. The evidence around this is clear. I'm gonna make some progress if the member doesn't mind, and I'll, I'll try and get through as much as time. Understanding and addressing the impact of ACEs is crucial to safeguarding children's current mental and physical health and well-being. We've made a commitment to develop trauma-informed approaches within services, ensuring that workers and staff have the necessary training and understanding of these complex issues. Our approach on alcohol is rooted in the World Health Organization's best buys of affordability, availability and attractiveness. Scotland is a global leader on alcohol policy. We've delivered 9, 915,000 alcohol brief interventions since 2008, legislated to ban irresponsible promotions, introduced a lower drink drive limit, and with the support from across the... I am going to make progress, as I said, and if there's time, I will bring members in once we get through some of the important matters that I have to cover. Um, with the support across the chamber, we introduced minimum unit pricing, our world first. On Tuesday, NHS Health Scotland published the first full year of off-trade sales data since minimum unit pricing was introduced. And that, these data, hugely uh, encouraging and showed a 3.6% drop in sales per adult. That reduction in consumption marks real progress, which I'm sure the Parliament will welcome. And I've heard calls uh, from some members for a higher price to be set, and I'm keeping that under review alongside all emerging evidence. Tackling um, attractiveness is also vital if we are to reduce consumption and harms. And our Count 14 awareness raising campaign launched for its second phase last week, and I urge all MSPs to promote it and amplify the message to keep risks low, stay within the maximum of 14 units per week. The evidence is, the evidence is clear that alcohol ad advertising seen by children and young people is associated with both starting to drink alcohol or in uh, young people already drinking with drinking more alcohol. And we know that the earlier a young person begins to drink alcohol, the more likely they are to drink in ways that will be risky later in life. So to address that, the framework has two significant actions 
to restrict alcohol mar marketing first, to press the UK government to restrict television and cinema advertising of alcohol, and secondly, to consult on a range of measures, including mandatory restrictions on alcohol marketing within the Dove powers. I, I'm going to make progress, as I've said, and, and I wanted to update the, the Chamber on the work of the task force, which will be the next item I'm going to. So, um, and to, so I've, I've already asked the... Um, the, uh, the, the, the Young Scott Health Panel to take forward the findings of the Children's Parliament report last year um, so that we can take that forward. They expect to uh, report in the spring and as set out in our alcohol framework, I will bring forward a consultation on this, uh, which I plan to publish later this year. We continue to take a public health approach with regards to drug use and the current emergency we have around drug-related deaths. This means examining the evidence around what we know works and what will, keep, what will help to keep people alive. There is no shortage of evidence on this topic. And in fact, the last few months have seen the publication of a number of reports highlighting uh, these issues. These all note the challenges that Scotland face and make recommendations on what we could be doing. However, all agree there is no single solution on, to this problem. There's no single bullet. Instead, what is required is a multi-layered approach from our health and social care sector and beyond. This needs to be uh, multidisciplinary um, and, and that is reflected within the makeup of our drug deaths task force. A membership I selected specifically to affect change in key areas where new action is required. The task force continues to develop pieces of work which will, as I said, I'm going to just go on to, to outlining some of the work of the task force, which I know members are keen to hear. There will be plenty of time um, for debate later. The task force is continuing to develop pieces of work which will directly address the levels of drug deaths which we are all currently seeing. In the short term, these has focused on making sure that where possible, we're providing people with the tools required to keep them alive which in respe respect of overdose deaths is the drug naloxone. And there's been a significant push to increase the availability of the drug, um, which can reverse the effects of an overdose. For example, just yesterday, I announced the funding of a pilot with the Scottish Ambulance Service, which will al allow them to trial distribution of naloxone to individuals following a non-fatal overdose. If this trial is successful, then we'd expect uh, that this practice to become the norm and for it to be rolled out uh, to other areas across Scotland. Furthermore, the chair of the task force has been working with the chief pharmaceutical officer on a proposal to have all community pharmacies trained in the administration of naloxone and to have naloxone available if requested, thereby providing a potentially life-saving service should someone approach them in an emergency. In December, I also wrote out to naloxone leads in health boards requesting that they make contact with homeless services to ensure that naloxone was made available to shelters and facilities being used by some of our most vulnerable people during the coldest months of the year. Again, to ensure that, that kits, peer support and appropriate training were accessible where it was required. The chair of the task force and I also wrote out to ADPs and integration authorities to provide them with the task force first set of formal recommendations to reduce drug deaths. We need to see these recommendations in local strategies for 2021. These recommendations cover targeted distribution of naloxone, improvement to medical assisted treatment and immediate response to non-fatal overdoses. The task force is also working on a number of longer term projects, including producing a set of national standards for the delivery of medication assisted treatment. This will help remove a variation, reduce variation of how services administer MAT and is uh, backed up by strong evidence. These standards will give people the choice of the type, of dose of, type and dose of medication that they need and access to same-day prescribing of MAT, something I'm regularly asked about. This will mean not limiting people to methadone, but also including buprenorphine and suboxone. I'll respond to amendments in my closing remarks, but in relation to the first paragraph of Alex Cole Hamilton's amendment, the subgroup um, will also look at diamorphine-assisted treatment and will be able to recommend whether the current pilot in Glasgow will be extended and rolled out. Another focus um, for the task force is the role of our justice system, recognising that there is more that we can do within and through the justice system to improve outcomes for individuals in appropriate cases. Both Police Scotland and the Crown Office are task force members and the Lord Advocate fully supports this work. People who experience problematic drug use are unwell. They need treatment. 
care and, a, a, and care and an end to the isolation that drug use can bring. In Scotland, we continue to develop, to develop initiative, innovative schemes. I, I really think time is going to be limited. I'm going to cover the, the actions of the task force. There's a lot to Actually, go through here. Actually, there is some time in hand but for I, I think interventions I, I'm, I'm going to be for tight. anybody. I'll, I'll, if there's uh, time it's a matter, don't to, to enable so people, please, Mr. Hamilton, it's to a enable people, for us. Bear with me. It's a matter for members. But just don't want people to feel they've got pressure of time all around the chamber because there is some time in hand in this debate. President, President Officer, that's good. My, my challenge is um, to get through the, the range of actions the task force has taken, and that's what I, I want to update the, the, the chamber on. Um, so in Scotland, we continue to develop an innovative schemes to enable people coming to the attention of the criminal justice system to be referred to the support services they need. That's similar to initiatives that I've seen recently in Durham. I'll, I will not shy away from the fact that my party has taken a position um, to view drugs use as a health issue rather than, than a criminal offence. And I know that that is not a position that is shared by everyone in this chamber. The international evidence is overwhelming and the additional stigma created by criminalisation does not work. It hampers personal change. It reinforces isolation and can stop people assessing the vital help that they need. In British Columbia and Portugal We've seen an appreciation of this set out in a um, grounded public health approach coupled with a sense of emergency and the need to bring compassion into the system designed to punish. That is why the Misuse of Drug Act 1971 is not fit for purpose and has, and has been designed for a different time and a different purpose. Alongside the task force work, we are continuing to develop our strategy. We published a partnership delivery framework setting out how uh, we work with partners and an action plan to deliver it. The strategy asks services to adapt to target those most in need and deliver services which address their specific circumstances. It's built on an eight-point treatment plan for ADPs to improve access to effective services and interventions. And that includes the need for assertive outreach and other harm reduction interventions for those at risk. I've been on a number of visits to a range of treatment providers and I've seen some fantastic work, but one of the main things that struck me is that there is a need for a variety, that no one approach will work for everyone. I hear re regularly about the need for more residential rehab and note the Conservative Party amendment on this, um, and we are mapping out current provision and trying to scope out the level of demand. I recognise the call for additional resource for the service um, options to be available available to more people. So the minister really, really tight. Uh, bear with me. But the until mini we, the minister, we really must begin to get back. Uh, almost there. But we, 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 so, so until that mapping is done and we, we need to get the evidence of demand, we need, we need to make sure that we are, are using uh, resources most appropriately. We remain committed to ensuring that recovery is at the heart of service provision and that we've encouraged every ADP to develop a recovery oriented care system that not only uh, for alcohol and drug services but within housing, prisons and employability services. We made um, no, commitments I'm sorry, to improve... Please, please, Minister, I'm sorry, but you must just move the motion now. You're over okay. by at least a so, minute now. In, in moving minutes. the motion, Presiding Officer, the harms of alcohol and other drug impacts on all of us, and it is really important that, and for the benefit of the families and communities that we work together, that this is vital work that we work together on. And I do appreciate that while there are differences across the cha yeah. chamber, the heartfelt views of, of everyone on this subject to, to try and make a difference. Thank please you, move the officer. motion. Please move the motion. Has he done it? Right. Sorry. I now call and Miles Briggs to speak to move amendment 20635.1. Mr Briggs, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd start by saying the evidence of demand, Minister, is that last year 1,187 people died. That's the evidence of demand. 8th of November 2012, that was the last time this Parliament has been debating drugs under the government's time. It's only thanks to opposition parties in this chamber using our debating time that we've been able to actually discuss drug deaths or manage to force SNP ministers to acknowledge that Scotland is facing a drug death emergency. Every life lost to drug addiction is a tragedy. And I know too many families in Edinburgh and across my own Lothian region who've been affected by drugs and those who prey on people living with addictions. Scotland's seen an escalation of drug death crisis over the last 10 years and although I have welcomed the establishment of the drug death task force we need to be honest and recognize the fact that we need to see a radical new approach if we're going to turn this situation around. The task force has outlined limited recommendations put forward yesterday and these are welcome but ministers need to understand that we need to see a root and branch re rethink of drug rehab services across Scotland. Like Monica Lennon 
I believe it was a mistake not to include cross-party support and involvement in the task force. And today, nothing I've heard suggests the new approach is actually being developed by SNP ministers. Now, I just hope that's not another lost opportunity to try to change the crisis. And that is what today I want to make this debate actually about delivering something, a new drug rehab, rehab bed fund, to start to work to give people hope and develop a new approach. Deputy President Officer, it's time for SNP ministers and this parliament to be totally honest. Scotland's drug and alcohol partnerships have been underfunded for 20 years and are the Cinderella service of our national health services. The cuts most recently made by ministers has significantly destabilised the sector and the pain is still being felt today with vital third sector services closing as we speak. Right in the middle of a drug deaths emergency, limiting the fragile support available with services being removed. Now, I've tried to work with SNP ministers since my election to warn them of this developing crisis and put forward workable suggestions and ideas. This debate should be about finding solutions and using the powers and budgets of the government to actually do this work. So we need to start with the principle that we need to see drug support services properly funded in this country so that people with addictions can get the support they need. And that's what my amendment is calling for today. With the budget coming to Parliament next week, the Scottish Parliament can tonight call for the government to provide the 15.4 million available to them to re properly fund residential rehabilitation beds across Scotland. Because the sad truth is, over the last decade in Scotland, we've seen rehab beds across our country slashed. In 2007, when this government came to power, there were 352 beds available to drug treatment services across Scotland. Today, there are just 70. If there's one thing we know the last de decade has seen, it has coincided with the dramatic reduction in beds and the explosion in drug deaths. Today, that must end, and a new approach to rehab and a national strategy should be developed by ministers. Deputy President over, Officer, over the summer recess, I undertook visits across Scotland to listen to those working at the front line in drug addiction services in all parts of Scotland. Speaking to service users and their families engaged and trying to get their lives back together, it was abundantly clear, as the ministers outlined, that access to services is a postcode lottery across this country. I was hugely impressed with what I saw at the Safest Houses project in Western Bartonshire. And I have to say that's the only service I've genuinely seen which truly embeds in pr the principle of wraparound care for individuals. That needs to be embedded in all services. For people living with addictions who have met, one key aspect, and the ministers touched on this, is childhood trauma and ACEs, often stemming from sexual abuse as children. For many with zero self-worth, well, self guilt, or simply using drugs as, as a coping mechanism, very quickly substance misuse spirals out of control. Now we often hear stories, and I make no apology for raising them in this chamber, around the crisis facing our mental health services. But we need to see a specific bespoke mental health services for those needing it who are using and substance misuse. Uh, and that's something we need to see developed as soon as possible. And that's something only the third sector, I think, can provide the capacity to do. For 30 years, we've built a system now based on sustaining addiction, not helping to try to, underlie the, underlie, under, under, to address the underlying reasons for that addiction. So we need to see a radical new approach to access mental health services. And let's be honest, that capacity isn't in the NHS, so we need to see funding for the third sector. We all want to see action to help try to turn this current situation around a situation ministers even accept as an emergency. So if SNP ministers genuinely want to make a transformational approach, and I hope they do, then we need to take forward more than what's been outlined today. We need to take an approach forward for drug and alcohol abuse, treatment, education and recovery. Only then can we as a country be able to deliver the real change that will help save lives now and prevent a future generation of drug deaths and substance abuse, destroying individuals, families and communities. Regardless of party politics, we all want to see this unacceptable situation turned around. That will take real leadership, Minister, and an honest approach to understand that services we hope can address substance misuse in communities across Scotland today are broken. And I move my amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Briggs. I call on Monica Lennon to speak to move amendment 20635.3. Ms Lennon, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish that we did not need to have this debate. Nothing we can say will heal the hearts of people who are affected by the harms and losses that we are discussing today. Every life lost to drugs and alcohol 
is a devastating tragedy. Families have heard politicians express sympathy for their loss many, many times. We respond with task forces, summits and strategies. And in reply, people are warning us, you keep talking, we keep dying. I am not embarrassed to admit that I feel frightened and overwhelmed by the scale of this public health emergency. I'm not convinced we even know the full extent of it. This is not the fault of one government, one law, one public body or policy. The blame game must end today because we won't succeed in preventing and tackling the harms caused by alcohol and drugs by stubbornly sticking to our fixed party positions. We need to make urgent changes at a UK level, at a Scottish level and in all of our communities. The Scottish Government motion is right to call for reform of the Misuse of Drugs Act and it is regrettable that the Conservatives have tabled an amendment that deletes this making it impossible for us to vote with them. This is deeply frustrating because the Conservative Amendment rightly calls for substantial investment in residential rehabilitation. The amendment in my name sets out the need for adequate funding. So Scottish Labour agrees with the government on the need to explore legislative change, but we do believe we can be bolder with the powers we already have. That's why we support the Liberal Democrat amendment. We back both reform and resources. That is the centre ground in this debate. So I think we all agree on the need to urgently implement measures that will save lives. The evidence shows us what to do. People whose lives are gripped by substance use, those who work with them daily, and people who are at various stages of recovery have told us what to do many times. When I led a members debate in September on the scale of the drug deaths, I pushed for legal designation of a public health emergency. This was resisted by the Scottish Government and the task force. Four months on, there is recognition in the government motion that this is a public health emergency. This acknowledgement is welcome. However, a public health emergency demands immediate action. I agree with Turning Point Scotland that the Drug Death Task Force is a welcome initiative, but it, that it does not replace the need for agencies to demonstrate the actions they are taking to reduce the deaths. Urgent and transparent action is needed. Anyone at a high risk of a drug-related death must be fast-tracked into treatment and support services within 24 hours because without this, people will continue to die in huge numbers. And if we are serious, we cannot accept a situation whereby the Forensic Toxicology Service that analyses 90% of Scotland's suspected drug-related deaths is dysfunctional. Families waiting several months to find out why their loved one died. It's cruel. Scottish families affected by alcohol and drugs is supporting people through these agonising waits, but they've already suffered enough trauma and they don't deserve this additional distress. And Scottish Drugs Forum are right to raise concerns about the potential impact of delayed toxicology and post-mortem reporting on the publication of official annual figures. We cannot afford to have huge gaps in this knowledge about trends in substance use. And previous assurances, I'm sorry to say from the Lord Advocate, have amounted to nothing. This is what happens in the absence of a clear, nationally coordinated response to this public health emergency. Yes. Alec Cole Hamilton. Very grateful for Monica Lennon giving way. I agree with everything she said so far. Uh, does she agree that the uh, delays that are being witnessed as a result of the toxicology reports being delayed are causing further harm and distress to families affected by drug deaths? Monica Lennon. Absolutely. It's, it's very um, upsetting and, I, and I'm in touch with a, a number of families and I, I can't believe that they're in this situation. But, you know, I recognise... The, the Minister, Joe Fitzpatrick, has been in his post, I think, since around June 2018. And I have to say, despite not taking intervention today, I have found him to be engaging and receptive to both criticism and to, to ideas to listen. But no member can be expected to tackle these complex and deep-rooted challenges 
on their own. A public health approach is crucial, as is cross-portfolio action. So I would say to the First Minister and all of her Cabinet, which includes the Lord Advocate, to step up, to share the responsibility and ensure that every part of government that can make a difference, no matter how small, is actively engaged in measures to prevent and reduce alcohol and drug harms. I know my colleague Jenny Mara will use her time to talk about the, the drastic situation in Dundee, where the Dundee Drugs Commission has made several important recommendations, but implementation has been too slow. Why do we continue to move at a snail's pace when people's lives are at risk? The forthcoming summit in February is an important opportunity. The recommendations of the Scottish Affairs Committee and the Health and Social Care Committee are rooted in international evidence and the UK government should accept this. As a minimum, safe consumption rooms should be piloted in Glasgow where rising HIV infection rates are an additional risk factor and in Dundee, the city with the highest drug death rate in Europe. Our amendment highlights where funding has been cut, not to point fingers, but to confront the consequences and ensure we make better choices in the future. In conclusion, presiding officer, I hope that today will lead to immediate action to save lives and to give people hope. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call Alec Cole Hamilton to speak to move Amendment 20635.2. Mr Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I very much welcome this debate. This is the business the Parliament should be focused on rather than debates about flags or the Constitution. Um, it is also seven, to, seven years too late. We have seen much water flow under the bridge since this Parliament last debated the drugs crisis in government time. And that has seen a situation where drug deaths in Scotland are soaring. In 2018, as uh, Miles Briggs, there were over 1,000 drug deaths in Scotland. This is more than double the figure that it was a decade ago. It is the worst rate in the whole of Europe and worst of anywhere in the developed world. The government must accept a large part of the blame for this. Regardless of any insistence that blame should lie in part with the UK government, I would say to them, our drug deaths are double that of those in England. And the Scottish Affairs Committee recently said that the Scottish government can do more with its existing powers. Instead, they decided in 2015 to make a 23% cut to alcohol and drug partnership funding, and that lasted for two years. This has played a pivotal role in our poor performance in terms of drug mortality rates. And all told, presiding officer, that represented two years where the budget for drug and alcohol services in our nation's capital was reduced by £1.3 million pounds each year. Dr Emily Tweed highlighted to the Scottish Affairs Committee that such funding cuts result in the withdrawal of services, reduced provision, understaffing uh, or, or underskilled staffing and a lack of continuity in relationships for clients. Something has got to change and it has to happen now. Whilst the monetary for the com commitment for the government to restore cuts, uh, which were taken in previous years, is a start, I am deeply alarmed that none of the Dundee Drugs Commission's recommendations, published back in August of last year, have been taken forward. Same-day prescriptions for methadone in Dundee should have been implemented immediately following expert recommendation. But there still are only two GPs that provide on-the-day prescriptions, with most patients waiting about three weeks. It's simply not good enough. Similarly, the Glasgow facility has been given the backing of the Home Office to treat patients with pharmaceutical-grade heroin, but it's not just about radical provision of heroin by NHS Scotland. The frequency of visits twice per day means that ongoing relationships are created created with nurses who can introduce patients to on-site physical and mental health checks and treatments. This is radical and we already know that it works based on our international evidence. Yet in the two years it will take to evaluate this scheme, a further 2,000 people will die. Instead of a single pilot in one city, as we know other parts of Scotland have got huge problems with heroin as well. So I would be interested to hear from the government in their closing remarks how they will establish proposals for a Scotland-wide network of facilities. Deputy Presiding Officer, the failures of this government on drug and alcohol and their myopic and savage cut to funding will cast a long shadow. And we don't have to look far beyond the walls of this parliamentary cha chamber to see evidence of that. Figures from September 2019 show that NHS Lothian has consistently been breaching the waiting time target for alcohol 
and drug treatment. The Scottish Government's local delivery plan standard states that 90% of people should be waiting no longer than three weeks for treatment. This has never been met in Lothian, and I would appreciate a commitment today from the Government that it will provide an inflation expansion in support of these services to make up for the years of cuts. But it's not just on drug treatment. This Government is failing. Families across Scotland are experiencing prolonged, painful waits for toxicology reports following the death of a loved one. They have contacted me. I know they have contacted each of you. Since February, around 2,000 reports have been delayed because of a staff shortage at Glasgow University. This is causing prolonged agony for families who have suffered the most imaginable, unimaginable loss. They have contacted all of us, and I'm certain they've contacted the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary to impart the abject distress that they feel, and each of them has a different story to tell with the same theme. Once again, families are paying the price for the cuts made to toxicology services. The impact of such a delay in confirming the cause of death can be profound on those who've lost a loved one. It isn't just answers that we're depriving them of, but closure too. I asked the Minister to give the details of the Scottish Government's attempts to remedy the, this situation in his closing remarks. I am pleased that the Scottish Government is beginning to see Scotland's drugs crisis as a public health issue. I welcome that. It's something my own party has been calling for for some time. And the UK Government continues to treat uh, drugs as a criminal justice issue. This perpetuates the problem, enhances stigma and discrimination. As evidence has shown, this approach is counterproductive. Accordingly, the Liberal Democrats believe that the response to this must be framed through the lens of health rather than justice. Unfortunately, the shift in focus from justice to health is only evident in part. In 2018, more people were imprisoned for possession of drugs for personal use than were given treatment orders. That political rhetoric just simply isn't percolating through. If the Scottish Government wants to call for greater powers to tackle drugs crisis, it must start by showing that it is effectively using its current powers to do everything it can to relieve services. This includes properly funding health services and recognising the profound link that exists between unresolved childhood tra trauma and adult drug and alcohol misuse. And I welcome very much the remarks that the, made, the minister made at the top of the debate, because we need to heed the recommendations of former Chief Medical Officer Sir Harry Burns, who in his review of NHS targets said that the one target we are not capturing in the NHS is the prevalence of those adverse childhood experiences. Without measuring them, we can't get to the pe help to the children and young adults who have suffered them. For as long as we ignore that challenge in our society, then all of this, as every aspect of the strategy and the strategies that we deploy today will exist only to fight fires that have been burning the hearts and in the minds of so many fractured people for so long. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Alison Johnson. Ms Johnson, six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to extend my thanks. Bear, bear with me a minute. Sorry, I don't think you moved your amendment. I like to be technical. Move the, and I move Thank the you very much, Ms Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to extend my thanks to all the organisations who provided a briefing for today, and I welcome this opportunity to debate this issue in Parliament. It is too often the most marginalised and vulnerable people in society who experience alcohol and substance misuse, so it's all the more important that we consider their needs, rights and experiences in this chamber. The Scottish Greens have long argued that drug-related deaths are a public health, not a criminal justice issue. The Misuse of Drug Acts 1971 is outdated. It must be overhauled if we're to minimise harm and tackle what has become an epidemic. Scotland is in the midst of a public health emergency. 1,187 people died of drug-related causes in 2018. That is 1,187 entirely preventable, unnecessary deaths. That is an emergency. And behind all of those statistics, of course, are the human and social costs. Drug and alcohol dependence represent trauma experienced by individuals and their friends and families, not to mention wasted individual potential and opportunity. We continue to fail those who are affected by drug and alcohol misuse at great cost to them, but also to society at large. This is a social justice issue. There's a well-established established link between deprivation and alcohol and drug addiction. It's our collective responsibility to tackle this issue and reach those who are often deemed unreachable. They're not unreachable. We simply have to try harder. Now, the motion rightly mentions stigma as a barrier to treatment. 
Pejorative terms such as junkie are hugely reductive and harmful, but they're still in common use today, too often in the media, who seek to demonise those with substance misuse issues. We wouldn't treat another health issue in this way. The systematic dehumanisation of drug users is nothing short of scandalous, and I have no doubt at all that it has contributed to that high figure that we're faced with today. And if we're serious about tackling stigma, we have to lead by example. Drug dependence is currently excluded from the Equality Act 2010, despite it being recognised as a health condition. And the Scottish Affairs Committee, in their report on problem drug use, concluded that this can have damaging real-life consequences for many people who use drugs, often by preventing them fully accessing recovery services. You know, this is a tragedy. Uh, uh, the the um, committee also called for the UK government to immediately review the decision to, to exempt drug dependence from equality legislation and to assess the impact that has on people who use drugs. And I would like to echo this call today. There is great work being done to reduce stigma, stigma more locally, however, including that around illnesses that are frequently associated with drug use. I, along with others in this chamber, am a hepatitis C parliamentary champion, and I've seen firsthand the considerable efforts being made to engage those who have or are at risk of contacting, contracting hepatitis C. And I've previously spoken in the chamber about the excellent work being undertaken by the Edinburgh Access Practice. It remains the case, however, that while an estimated 21,000 people in Scotland have hepatitis C, around 50% remain undiagnosed. So clearly, efforts to tackle stigma and improve outreach have to focus on reaching those who may have contracted diseases which wrongly are stigmatised, such as hepatitis C or HIV. It is vital too that we continue to highlight the impact of alcohol misuse on our society. And minimum unit pricing was a positive step and studies are already beginning to show its successes, but alcohol dependency still pervades Scotland. One in four people drink at hazardous or harmful levels and there were 1,136 alcohol-specific deaths in 2018. There is much yet to be done, and as has been mentioned previously, action on advertising is key. Professor David Nutt. Yes, certainly. Jenny Mara. Allow me to ask the same question I wanted to ask the Minister. Does she think that plain packaging of alcohol in Scotland is a good idea to make uh, alcohol less attractive, as the Minister said? Um, I think that is an absolutely splendid idea and one that we need to look at very quickly and, and pursue. Um, you, you, know, you only have to look at the marketing budgets of, of companies producing alcohol to know how important they think the look of it is, um, particularly to young people. Um, Professor David Knott, um, you may remember, was the former UK government drugs advisor who was unceremoniously sacked in 2009. He has consistently argued that alcohol is more harmful than some Class B and even Class A drugs. Now, we can't afford to ignore lived experience or the advice of experts such as Professor Nutt, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us. And Alcohol Focus Scotland has highlighted the availability of alcohol as a key issue. Here in Scotland, it's really easy to obtain, and that makes regular alcohol consumption uh, a normal part of everyday life. There are approximately 16,700 premises licences in force in Scotland, 16 times more than GP practices. And while the alcohol licensing system is the main method of regulating the availability of alcohol, licensing, licensing boards approve approximately 97% of licence applications, and that number is increasing. So the Scottish Government has committed to review and improve licensing and I'd urge it to follow through in this commitment because the, the current system isn't serving the interests of Scotland's people. Um, Presiding Officer, I appreciate that the Scottish Government is continuing its attempts to engage with the UK Government about drug-related deaths and I'll eagerly await the outcome of the summit to be held in Glasgow on the 27th of February. But as Alex Cole-Hamilton's amendment st states, there are steps that be, can be taken now. Um, I welcome the three-month trial of paramedics supplying take-home kits of naloxone. Um, but late-stage late interventions, however welcome and important and effective, they cannot be the only answer. We need to engage with people long before they reach the stage of near-fatal overdose. Presiding officer, I appreciate that I'm over time and will conclude my remarks. Thank you.
Well, you'd taken an intervention, so I made allowances, and we've got little time, a little bit of time in hand now for interventions. I call Shona Robinson to follow by Brian Whittle. Officer, I, I welcome this debate and hope it will provide an opportunity to find areas of agreement rather than division. Hopefully an opportunity to agree that there are no simple solutions to what are complex problems and reject any infantilising of the issue. Neither is there one single solution, whether that be more rehab beds or indeed safe consumption rooms. Both are needed, but along with many other changes. And I also think we need to be honest, as others have said with ourselves, that over the 20 years in this parliament, under governments of different political colours, we have not yet managed to get to grips with the drugs issue. To date, maybe we have been too timid, and I include myself in that, but I believe that that is now changing. We're now openly discussing some very radical and indeed controversial issues, looking to potential radical drug treatment models such as those in Portugal, British Columbia. And I'm not sure that would have been the case a few years ago, and that's to be welcomed. And I do pay tribute to Joe Fitzpatrick for pursuing this. Drug and alcohol harm are issues that affect all parts of Scotland. However, as we know, Dundee has been badly affected by the issue, with the critical issue of drug deaths being forefront in our minds, as outlined in the Minister's opening speech. Given this, we need to face the challenges of drug and alcohol abuse head on, to take the lead in identifying how we can be more effective and in implementing new approaches to the issue. Back in August of last year, the Dundee Drugs Commission published its report, Responding to Drug Use with Kindness, Compassion and Hope. The report did not shirk from identifying weaknesses in the local systems and bringing forward a number of challenging recommendations. Implementing these recommendations is an ongoing process and of course I like many others would like to see that happen more quickly. However I am encouraged that some progress is being made and I hope the Minister will take time to reflect on these positive changes and feed them into the Scottish Government's task force. I asked what progress has been made and um, I'll come on to uh, some of the what I think is significant uh, uh, areas of progress. The Dundee uh, Alcohol and Drug Partnership produced an action plan for change which has led to some highly encouraging developments in practice. So last November, a test of change was introduced to identify and establish a fast and effective multi-agency response to all non-fatal overdoses in Dundee. This new approach includes sharing information on non-fatal overdoses with the Scottish Ambulance Service and Police Scotland uh, on a daily basis, daily meetings of staff from relevant statutory and third sector services where the cases are discussed and a plan developed. People taking lead responsibility for the actions in rela relation to each individual and workers attempting to contact people not known to services to offer advice and support to engage with services as a hugely important because those are the most at-risk group uh, as we know and um, uh, very briefly Alec Cole Hamilton very grateful to the member for giving way she's spoken eloquently about the ADP in her area does she regret her government's decision to cut 23 percent of ADP funding Shona Robertson uh, Alex Cole Hamilton there are ADPs that underspend, there are ADPs that overspend, the performance of them is hugely variable. I think the first thing we need to agree is what needs to happen in terms of services and then fund the services that actually work. That's what today's debate is about. And of course that has to be adequately funded, but I think we have to get right what it is we're funding, first of all, and it has to be evidence-based and it has to work. Um, I want to talk about um, same-day prescribing, which Alec Cole Hamilton also mentioned a few minutes ago. From the test of change back in October 2019, uh, the same-day prescribing has now been fully implemented across the city. This involves the Dundee Integrated Substance Misuse Service running direct access dropping assessment clinics where people receive a comprehensive assessment of their substance use and other aspects of their lives um, and social circumstances. Life-saving training on overdose awareness and naloxone kits are available and people are offered screening for blood-borne viruses. Support plans for welfare benefits and housing support are also developed if needed. I think this joined-up approach has been extremely successful and we need to see that model used for the rest of Scotland. The issue of unplanned discharges where people simply stop taking their treatment or attending services can, of course, lead to many spiralling back into addiction. 
And I've also been interested by the use of uh, buprenorphine, which has the advantage of being a long-lasting injection, which only requires monthly administration. While I understand it's primarily used where methadone is unsuitable, I wonder if the Minister and the Government plan to look into the possible advantages of using it more widely. So, some progress made, but of course, much more to be done. We need to keep the pressure up to ensure that momentum continues for change, and I certainly will be doing that. I want to turn briefly to the issue of alcohol misuse and the emerging evidence of the benefits of minimum unit pricing, a policy very close to my heart. And if that tells us anything, it tells us where we are bold and take risks with public health approaches, we see the benefits and that's what we need to apply to the drugs issue. It is encouraging that the government's minimum pricing appears to be bearing fruit. The reduction in alcohol sales is welcome and is hopefully one step on the road to resetting our relationship with alcohol. I'm also encouraged by research that indicates that the health gains anticipated by a reduction in consumption will be greatest for those that suffer the greatest harm, hazardous and harmful drinkers in poverty. Finally, presiding officer, I'm encouraged that positive steps are being taken and by the apparent consensus we have across this chamber to work together to tackle these issues and indeed to take more radical steps in both drugs and alcohol policy. Thank you very much, and I call Brian Whittle, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I do welcome the opportunity to once again speak in a debate on the ex escalating addiction crisis in Scotland. Uh, to be honest, I just wish I had a little bit more time to get everything in I want to say, but I think with other members in here, I think it's really important that we try and keep this outside of the political arena uh, and political posturing. I think tackling the issue of addiction uh, must consider how we ensure a person-centred care approach for those caught in addiction, as the Minister uh, alluded to. But also, I think the long-term goal of preventing people following into that addiction trap. To be effective in these objectives, it's crucial that the causes of addiction are recognised and we accept there is no blanket policy silver bullet. Everyone with an addiction has a unique story, so the treatment framework should reflect this. According to the conclusions from the conference uh, entitled A Matter of Life and Death, at which there were some 110 organisations associated with prevention and treatment of drug and alcohol abuse, including the chair uh, of the task force, some of the main causes of drug and alcohol misuse include marginal marginalisation and inclusion, lack of social structure, poor relationships, lack of protective factors, self-medication associated with masking the pain of ACEs, and previous trauma, stigma, self-deprecation, barriers to achieving, and homelessness. Deprivation and inequality make the above more acute, leading to a more likely situation where there is an inability to access quality treatment and help, a lack of access to general community services, an unmet complex health need, and a lack of an effective support structure. I think in terms of uh, accessing services, what, what I was talking to uh, in, in, that, uh, in that particular conference with, uh, around, and a roundtable discussion, we were talking about the way we expect those caught in addiction to travel to a very limited number of outlets to access uh, their methadone or other medication. And in there, I found out that there's a bus that travels into Kilmarnock that locals have now called the heroin bus. To get their medication, they must go into the town centre. So they were suggesting, why do we not take that service to them? So I'm bringing that to the chamber. A, a mobile pharmacy could not only make access easier, it could offer so many other services, such as testing for hepatitis, or an HIV, or even blood testing for, that, for stage one and two lung cancer, another one of the big killers in the lower quintiles. I'm just asking the question, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, but once someone has a drug problem, they also have more limited means to escape poverty. The chances of attaining paid employment is also much reduced from problem drug use to being in treatment and recovery. Having a criminal record or a lack of an employment history and the stigma of having or having had a substance problem all play its part. So it stands to reason that resource should be allocated prior to an addiction. This has to be the most cost effective in, uh, investment. Simply put, we know where these areas of highest problems are so how do we ensure that the solutions and investments are targeted? If there are fewer community resources in these areas, then develop those resources to fit the communities. I think the systematic demise of community assets has to stop. I think these facilities are where the most likely access to activities and inclusion will take place. 
And I've said many times in this chamber that the school estate is massively underutilised, and that's a place where we could create that community cohesion, and I think that is essential in the element of prevention. Now, I was in the Kilmarnock uh, rec uh, Recovery Cafe uh, a couple of Fridays ago, and it opens on a Friday between the, uh, the hours of five and seven, and it serves a three-course meal uh, uh, for two pounds, and it's run by those who are in recovery. In that time, there were 74 people in there, and the overwhelming feeling in that place was one of hope. Here were people gaining control of their lives and their addictions, people with a sense of purpose and a sense of belonging. Mark, the person who runs the cafe, would love to take that model out into the surrounding communities every day. He would like to offer a 24-7 service for those in need, including offering recovery beds. But he is operating, like many uh, uh, third sector organisations, on a shoestring. Now, he is applying for funding to expand the service. So my ask, uh, ministers, why don't the Scottish Government partner operations such as this, where they are being incredibly successful, where we know the hardest people to reach will be? There are many services out there in the social or criminal justice system for those uh, and for those on the periphery. What is needed is given access to those services for those who currently don't know how to or are wary of them in a manner that suits those needs. As a rule, addicts need an incentive to quit, an incentive to make the first step. When you're sitting doing nothing all day, have little money, no work or little means of getting it, a hit is an out from a bleak reality. Now I would suggest to members that they listen to stories for participants in things like the Homeless World Cup, how that opportunity for inclusion can be the incentive needed to get on the path of recovery. A conduit to these services required, like the recovery cafe in Kilmarnock, established centres like that are the most likely entry point for those already not in the system. What I'm arguing for is bet uh, have I got time? Only if you finish straight away afterwards. Oh, I, I, I need to finish this bit, sorry. Um, established sensors like that are the most likely entry point for those not already in the system. What I'm arguing for is a better and consistent funding for those organisations and linking them in with existing services, which would be more effective for the service user, less expensive, with a far greater likelihood of success. I think recognising uh, their value in a system like this was crucial. Once the system at a recovery cafe has to, be con uh, has to be a continuing pathway of options, other specialised third sector organisations, delivery of NHS services on site, housing advice, DWP advice, and I think social services would be willing participants if we could free up resource over and above their current caseloads. <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, I think uh, if I could uh, just finish here, the Scottish Government is, seems set on creating new solutions, especially for those over which they have little control. I would say to them, if they would invest in solutions that are already working, connect those services in a cohesive and progressive plan, then they may find that they have a greater increased influence over the elements they deem out of their control. Please stop hiding behind the elements of po policy over which you currently have little interest, influence sorry, and Must invest in the multitude please. of proven op op options within your sphere of control. Deputy Presiding Officer. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Neil Findlay. Pleased the government has brought forward such a vitally important debate this afternoon. We must protect children and young people from marketing and health harming products, especially alcohol. Uh, as co-convener of the Cross Party Group on Improving Scotland's Health 2021 and Beyond, along with Brian Whittle and David Stewart, I, I've been particularly struck by evidence of how young people recall examples of alcohol marketing, can identify alcohol brands, and the exposure to alcohol marketing is associated with increased consumption high-risk drinking, susceptibility to drink, and brand knowledge among young people. Half of young people surveyed had seen at least 32 instances of alcohol marketing in a month, one or more a day, which is simply too high. Another disturbing study conducted in 2015 by Alcohol Focus Scotland found that 10 and 11-year-olds were more familiar with certain beer brands than leading brands of crisps and ice cream. Alcohol marketing is particularly prominent in sport as brands are often high-profile sponsors of major events viewed by millions of adults and children alike. It's easy to see why clubs are attracted to the income alcohol sponsorship can provide, but ultimately marketing drives consumption and harm, and there should be no place for alcohol marketing in sport. Tobacco sports sponsorship was banned 15 years ago. It's now unimaginable for any high-profile team to be brand ambassadors for tobacco, so why is it acceptable for alcohol? I'm delighted that Scottish women's footballers rejected health-harming sponsorship and only wish that the wider sports community would follow their admirable example. Alcohol marketing reduces the age at which young people start drinking, increases the likelihood they will drink, and if they already drink, the amount of alcohol 
they consume. Scotland has led the way internationally with its progressive approach to preventing alcohol harm and continues to do so through the Al current Alcohol Framework 2018. Pioneering measures have already shown positive effects in reducing harm. Just earlier this week, as has already been recounted, research published by NHS Scotland showed that the amount of alcohol sold here fell during the first year of minimum unit pricing while sales increased south of the border, where there is no such policy. Modelling shows that minimum unit pricing is expected to save 392 lives in the first five years of implementation. Health gains are anticipated to be greatest for those who suffer the greatest harm, hazardous and harmful drinkers in poverty. We have long recognised that drink driving is completely unacceptable and Scotland's stringent road safety laws were strengthened further by the SNP government's introduction of drunk, uh, drug driving limits and roadside testing in October last year. With a zero tolerance approach to the eight drugs most associated with illegal use, including cannabis, heroin and cocaine, this makes it easier to hold drug drivers to account, as there is no longer a requirement to prove someone was driving in an impaired manner. Behind every statistic on alcohol and drug-related deaths, of course, there are people, families and communities deeply affected by tragedy. This was particularly brought home to me just last week when I joined the Emergency Services Third Sector Councillors drug experience recovery development workers and others who are dedicated to reducing drug fatalities at the North Ayrshire Summit on Drug-Related Deaths in Solcoats. The speakers, including Katrina Matheson, Chair of the SNP Government's Drug Death Task Force, the event was informative and at times very moving. It showed ordinary boys and girls in everyday settings such as at school, play or home who once had their own hopes and ambitions and the devastating impact their subsequent addiction and deaths had on their families and communities. We do indeed face a drug deaths emergency. A reformed addict said to those gathered at Solcoats that finding addicts is easy. Most live in ordinary homes and are registered as tenants or for the council tax. Engaging them in services is the difficulty. For that, it's crucial to recognise the often horrific damage lives many endured as children and remove the stigma from addiction. Nax alone has a key role to play and ambulance paramedics are to, be, uh, are to give patients at risk of a drugs overdose medication which could save their life as part of a pilot scheme in Glasgow. Scotland's Drug Desk Task Force is funding a three-month take-home Naxalone trial which will see those treated by paramedics for a non-fatal overdose who don't want to go to a hospital given a Naxalone kit to take home. Yes. Monica Lennon. <coughs> I'm grateful to Kenny Gibson. Um, I agree with your points about naloxone and the, the ambulance service. Does the member share my concern that the Scottish Police Federation um, appear quite reluctant to see officers use naloxone and do we need to see more progress made in this area between the Scottish Police and the government? Kenneth yes, Gibson. actually, I completely agree with Monica Lennon on that. In fact, the, the, what we were advised very strongly was that as many professional groups who have direct contact with people who actually um, misuse uh, opium and, uh, uh, products should actually be trained in naloxone, and that certainly should include the emergency services, including, of course, the police forces. So I thank Monica Lennon for that important point. A training in Naxalone will be given on how to use the drug, which can reverse the effect of an opioid overdose, and the medication can then be used in the event of any future overdose before the ambulance arrives, reducing the risk of death. And, of course, the police force uh, is often the first on the scene. 500 kits have been provided for the plot, uh, the pilot, sorry, if successful, and it could be made permanent and extended to other areas of Glasgow and Scotland. Having uh, naloxone available can and does save lives. Around half of those whose death was drug-related had also suffered a non-fatal overdose at some earlier point. Uh, the, the, the SNP government supports the embedding of uh, naloxone provision in local NHS health board areas and now it's closely with local partners to ensure uh, naloxone provision remains a priority and is accessible for those who most need it. I know there are people in North Ayrshire who would benefit from these life-saving measures and I look forward to the outcome of the pilot and it being widened if successful, as I anticipate it will be. Harm reduction is vital, whether through providing clean needles, methadone, or the three priorities advocated by the European Monitoring, Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction to reduce deaths, uh, which are establishing consumption rooms, 87 of which operate across EU governments and which the UK Tory government has set itself against. Improved bystander response when an overdose, a overdose actually takes place and, of course, development of the take-home Naxalone policies I've already mentioned. 
Presiding officer, we should remember that over-the-counter and prescription drugs from painkillers such as paracetamol to sleeping pills such as Zopiclone can also kill an overdose. Indeed, many high-profile celebrity deaths from Michael Jackson to Prince died from prescribed medication. It is therefore important that patients are made fully aware of the potential impact of overdose to close, and not provided with too many uh, tablets on one prescription and over-the-counter tablets are more difficult to manage, so warnings should be made more obvious. Thank you, presiding officer. Neil Finlay, followed by Ruth McGuire. Uh, President Officer, I will focus my remarks on drugs since we haven't had a debate on the issue in this Parliament since 2012. And I have to say to the Minister, I found his conduct today failing to engage with members who wanted to engage in this very serious debate, one that has killed thousands of our constituents across the country. Absolutely shameful, I have to say. Um, I'm going to suggest practical, practical suggestions. Sorry? Carry on, please do. Just, just, just to make the point uh, that... Excuse me, excuse me, I'm sorry. here. Oh, sorry. Joe Fitzpatrick. Sorry, Presiding Officer, just to make the point that um, I, I will be closing the debate and will be absolutely happy to, to take an intervention at that point. I had a lot of information to get through, but, but if the member has particular questions for me now, then I will respond just now. Neil Finlay. That's quite all right, quite all right, Minister. I think you, you can uh, listen to the tone of the debate, but I think you can understand why people in this chamber are unhappy with your conduct today. Um, I'm going to suggest a number of practical suggestions uh, for change based on my experience of speaking to people who have been through addiction, their families who are desperate for help, and those who are trying to provide support in underfunded and under-resourced services. They are their suggestions, they are not my suggestions. So this is, uh, this is their list. They should be following what some of the most progressive police and crime commissioners are doing in England and Wales, where drugs, uh, 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 offenders who have been involved with drugs sign a contract to undergo mental health and other treatment. And that help is offered consistently to address their drugs use. Secondly, we should be bringing police, community and public health funding together to deliver practical outcomes for those in need. We should be setting up mental health teams and police stations. This was the top ask from police officers I spent time with over the summer. We should allow drug users who have not responded to other forms of treatment to be prescribed heroin in a medical setting. We should extend, yes, extend naloxone, but it must be funded, Minister. The complaints that I'm getting back is that the funding is not following it. Uh, we must establish early morning programmes to alert people about new drugs or risky behaviours on the streets so that we can intervene early. We must stop cutting alcohol and drug budgets and invest in treatment and mental health services. A political decision, Mr Whittle, a political decision by the then Cabinet Secretary, who's already spoken in the debate, to cut ADP budgets a few years ago, in my opinion, cost lives. And it was utter fantasy that the, that, that the Minister said that the IGBs at that time would find some magic beans to fill the gap. That was a cruel fantasy peddled, and I noticed she took no responsibility for her actions when she spoke. Uh, we should be testing ecstasy and other drugs at festivals, concerts and gatherings to reduce harms and deaths and to educate users. At the Elro Town Music Festival at the Royal Highlands Showground last year, Police Scotland issued this warning before the event. It said, please remember that you'll be subject to a search before entering the venue and if you're found to have drugs, you may face a criminal record. We have detection search dogs supporting the operation who have very keen noses. This is not a harm reduction or education approach. It simply drives more risky behaviour and more life-threatening behaviour. We need to stop criminalising and jailing people for drugs use. We need to treat them instead. We need to take action on benzodiazepines and other antidepressants with a long-term, gradualist approach to reduce unnecessary over-prescription and over-consumption where that is appropriate. Just one second, I will. Uh, and we need to stop people being displaced onto the streets to take street versions. Six point, I think it was six million uh, items of antidepressants were prescribed in a nation of five million people last year. Prescription and street benzos are a huge problem. Mr Whittle. Sorry, Brian Whittle. Yeah, thank, thank, thank the member for taking intervention and in listening to, to his comments here. I, I can't disagree with, with a lot of what he said, but what he hasn't got to yet, the other side of the coin there is, how do we prevent people getting involved in the drug culture in the first place? I think that, that is a key element as well. Neil Finlay. You, you mentioned in your opening uh, comments, Mr Whittle, that you didn't want this politicised. 
but it has to be politicised because it's the political choices that government makes, like austerity that drives people into poverty and inequality that results in the downward, downstream effect of them getting involved in drug and alcohol use. So it is a political issue, whether you like it or not. We have to extend the provision of mental health crisis centres, like the Penumbra one in Leith, which provides emergency crisis accommodation and a safe place for respite. You know, it's the only one of its kind in the whole of Scotland. We need that network rolled out across the country. We need to get people off the streets and into accommodation with support. The HIV outbreak in Glasgow is predominantly affecting homeless drug users. We need to stop discharging people. And by the way, people with any condition from hospital onto the streets with nowhere to go and no follow-up care. And we need to stop allowing people to draw out of the treatment system. These are the people that are most at risk of death. We need to end the cuts to youth work, housing support, community education, funding for the voluntary sector and social work. All of these impact on the drugs crisis. These are the services that civilise us as a society. And it's no surprise that drug deaths have increased as these services have declined. And we need to extend projects like Aid and Abet in Edinburgh, working with offenders and young people and provide the residential rehab that people have spoken about. Why is it that people with deep pockets can go to the Priory and get treatment? Because they get intense, successful residential treatment for their condition. We need the same for people without deep pockets. And finally, let me say this. If this was a crisis impacting on cattle or sheep or chickens, or if it affected the people of Morningside or Bridge of Allen or Jordan Hill or Bears Den, things would have changed a long time ago. But it's not. It's a crisis affecting the homeless. It's a crisis affecting the poor. It's a crisis affecting people in housing schemes in formal industrial towns and villages across Scotland. It affects the weak, the vulnerable, people who it is easy for politicians and people in power to ignore. This is a class issue, and it's to our collective shame that good, decent working class families are being failed by the system. All speakers so far have gone over time, so we're running short, absolutely no more than six minutes. From now on, Ruth Maguire, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Uh, Presiding officer, too many friends, family and neighbours have been lost to an avoidable early death caused by substance misuse. The reality is that problematic drug and alcohol use is something that we're all impacted by, and it's in all our interests to work together to prevent um, and reduce harm and to support recovery. 38 lives were lost in North Ayrshire in 2018. It's expected that that will be higher in 2019. So I'm going to focus my remarks on drug death today. No one person, no one government, no one organisation, no single intervention can end this tragedy of preventable, avoidable death. And it is a tragedy. The question is rightly asked if this number of accidental deaths, accidental poisonings, were being caused by something else, if our collective response would be quicker, would be better. In the actions that we are taking, we need to ask that question of ourselves. We need to ask that question of our governments, our IJBs, our ADBs, DPs and our health boards. If we're serious, and I believe colleagues in the chamber are, about the lives of those at risk, we must show by our actions, as well as our words, that they're important lives, that they're people worth saving. What Scotland faces in terms of drug deaths is an emergency, and I welcome the Scottish Government's acknowledgement of that and their recognition that more can and must be done to help improve the quality and provision of service that we already have. To save lives, to prevent avoidable deaths, we must meet people where, we, where they are. We must treat all individuals with dignity, compassion and respect and without judgment. Do everything in our power to make things safer using policy and practice that we have evidence works. Harm reduction is important. Yesterday, I was pleased um, to welcome the announcement from the Scottish Government that the Drugs Death Task Force will support a three-month trial providing 500 naloxone kits to the Scottish Ambulance Service. The Scottish Ambulance Service already responds to many potential fatal opioid overdoses by directly administering naloxone to reverse the overdose and save a life. This additional step with the take-home kits is very positive. 
514 naloxone kits were handed out in North Ayrshire in 2019, and it was reported that 45 lives had been saved. North Ayrshire Council is now training additional community development staff to administer the life-saving drug, action that should be commended. I'd like to thank Scottish families affected by alcohol and drugs, um, not just for the good work that they do, but for their briefing. And I add my voice in support of the asks of their family reference groups. They consider naloxone to be a critical part of saving lives and ask that all workers coming into contact with individuals at risk should carry naloxone and be trained in its use. I agree. Police, fire, ambulance, housing, homeless work, homelessness workers, primary care and pharma pharmacy services are all well placed to save lives. Now, I do understand the reticence that some non-healthcare workers may have felt previously that naloxone had to be injected, and I can understand why that would cause concern. However, there's now a nasal application which I hope um, removes that barrier. Those, protected, those tasked with protecting lives in Scotland can also be life savers. Now, whilst I recognise the need for local flexibility and community solutions, I also concur with the ask that any postcode lottery and provision is removed. If housing officers in Ayrshire can save lives administering naloxone, and they have, those skills, procedures and um, processes should be replicated across Scotland. The sharing of knowledge, skills and best practice is essential. If drop-in access and same-day prescribing as an option can be offered in one part of the country and it works, it absolutely should be replicated. It should not be easier to buy dangerous street drugs than it is to get safe treatment. A truly person-centred um, treatment will meet people where they are, recognise the barriers that are in their way and remove them. Same-day flexible drop-in appointments along with scheduled appointments seems sensible. We must recognise that systems and processes that work fine for one group can actually disadvantage others. Presiding officer, my party and others have rightly made much of the damage that punitive sanction regimes in the benefit system exact on people. So I was utterly horrified to learn that they may form part of the system of drug treatment. These should be stopped immediately. Withdrawal of treatment for missing an appointment is outrageous. It does not sound person-centred, and that's me being kind. It is not empowering, kind, compassionate or respectful. I know the Minister has these values himself, so I would ask in closing that he shares what action he'll take to end the practice of punitive sanctions in drug treatment. Presiding officer, lives are being saved um, and services are being delivered right now by kind, compassionate professional workers who share our pain and distress at rising deaths. And importantly, we also have people in our communities who are in recovery right now, who are supporting their peers with hope and purpose in their lives. Let's listen to them, let's learn, but most importantly, act with urgency and immediately make the changes that we know will save lives. Life's worth saving. Michelle Ballantyne, followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, presiding officer. In 2016, I gave evidence at a drug death inquiry for a, a young man who was, in fact, just 16. And during that evidence session, we talked a lot about what needs to change, what we can do, and how we can do it. The problem is we haven't done it, and we need to move forward. We need to understand that actually to treat drug and alcohol and I'm going to talk about drugs from now on, but I include alcohol, because I think as has been mentioned in today's debate, alcohol is the biggest drug that we abuse in this country, and it causes the most deaths and the most problems. So let's talk about it together. To actually address the problems, the first thing you have to be is motivated to change. And the day you decide you're motivated to change, the service has to be available to you. It's no good ringing up and being told, we'll put you on a waiting list and we'll see you in three weeks or four weeks or six weeks. You need to be seen that day because it is that day that you are in the right place to address the issues you're facing. So that's the first thing. We have to fund our services properly and they have to be available when you need them, where you need them. Certainly. David Stewart. I'm grateful for the member giving way and I know she's had a very strong background in this issue. 
just to share my view that it's time that we implemented the social responsibility levy on the windfall profits of large alcohol retailers so we can fund more alcohol treatment centres across Scotland. Michelle Ballantyne. I think in, in that statement you miss one thing, is that many of them already do fund a lot of the treatments. The Robertson Trust is a huge funder of treatment and support through alcohol, and certainly my service got a lot of money from the Robertson Trust, and all that money comes from alcohol. So, so a lot of that is already happening. So I think we have to be careful that we don't use a penal approach when actually we're already getting a lot of services. And in fact, Diageo offered me a lot of money to put support services across schools, and it was the education system that told me I couldn't use alcohol money to support a system in school to prevent alcohol abuse. So the, there are some things that don't tie up very well, and I think we need to be very careful about how we do it and how we look at it. But I think what's been interesting in today's debate so far is, is two things. First of all, we need to recognize that substance misuse is a symptom of other problems. And if we understand that and we understand that properly, then we are more likely to be able to change things going forward. So we have to address the things that lie underneath substance misuse. And many years ago, when I was looking at this and developing services, one of the things that became very stark is that we could almost not talk about drugs. We could almost not talk about drugs and solve the problem. What we had to talk about is, is where are your vulnerabilities? Why have you got low, low self-esteem? the aces that have really affected your life, the loneliness, the peer pressure. These are the things that we need to get a hang hold on. Yep. Alison Johnson. I think one thing that has been absent in this, uh, this debate, which has been largely consensual that action has to be taken, is the fact that the Scottish Conservatives, that your wider UK party, have taken billions out of the welfare system that so many of our most vulnerable citizens rely on. You must agree that this is having an impact. Michelle Ballantyne. Well, I was actually working in the drug and alcohol system before the changes in welfare. So it's actually not as simple as that. And in fact, the problem with substance abuse is it crosses all boundaries. Um, I, I heard very clearly um, what a member was saying earlier about it. it. It is only working class families. I can tell you it absolutely isn't. It crosses all boundaries. However, and this is, this is the thing I think we need to bear in mind, I need to make some progress here, that we have to bear in mind, is that quite often the, the substance abuse comes after the poverty. So drug abuse doesn't cause homelessness, homeless often causes drug abuse. So there are definitely connections in that sense, and we need to be very aware of that. But I, I want to move to talk about effective treatment, because that's really what we, we are looking at here. What is effective? Well, first of all, early intervention and prevention. We absolutely need to upstream some money to talk about early intervention and prevention. We need to make sure that we are addressing young people and making sure that they're not taking the steps down the route that we're trying to prevent. We need to make sure their esteem is high, that they value themselves. We need to make sure they have good education and opportunity so that they don't end up going down the, the route of drowning their sorrows. But we also need to recognize that over two thirds of children who live in substance misusing households will go on to misuse themselves. And therefore, if we allow, if we park people as um, productive drug users, and we accept that a methadone program is okay year in, year out. We are confining often their children to become substance misusers down the line. Methadone was introduced to titrate people off drugs. It was never meant to be a long-term condition. Um, last week, I was actually sitting down with, with a drug user at the food bank. He has been on methadone now for 11 years. 11 years. And his comment to me was, well, I need to get a job first. He's now lost his house as well, so I'll need to get housing, and then I'll look at my drug misuse. Now, there is some sense in that, and the Housing First program is definitely a very positive move in that we need to get people into stable positions so that we can address their problems. If you could come to And I want to mention very quickly rehab beds, because one of the problems with rehab beds is quite often they're in psych psychiatric units now. It's not appropriate. They need to be in appropriate things. I took a young person to a rehab bed. You must come to they a close. They could let anybody in. We couldn't restrict who arrived. And guess who arrived on day two? Their drug dealer. 
So we have to think very carefully about what we're doing and how we do it. So that's my plea to you. Thank you. Bob Doris, followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you, President Officer. I know only too well the blight that drug deaths crisis has had on the communities that I represent, how it has destroyed too many families and unfairly stigmatised too many communities. Communities blighted by drugs are not second class or third rate. They're dignified and they're resilient, but they need our help, all of our help. Now, I do welcome the, the pilot of the use of naloxone announced yesterday by the Minister in Springburn in my constituency. And as we know, the Scottish Ambulance Service will now not just use naloxone to seek to save those who suffer a heroin overdose, but crucially, they will also provide naloxone kits to survivors and their families and train them on how to use naloxone should another overdose occur. I am confident that's the right thing to do and I'm equally confident that it will save lives in my constituency and beyond, and I welcome it. Of course, we all know one of the main risks, factors in dying on overdose in the first place is an earlier non-fatal overdose. As Shona Robinson mentioned, we must ask what support is available for those vulnerable individuals following a near-fatal overdose, not just wait for the next one. What are the interventions at that point? We know addiction services are under strain, and we know that makes it far more difficult to offer the personalised approach to supporting those in addiction or seeking recovery that the Minister has referred to and that will support in this place. Of course, that has to be addressed. Now, I want um, also to make sure that uh, any strategy we have in relation to naloxone, for example, that three-month strategy should be very quickly rolled out. Um, I think Intuitive will know that is going to be successful. So I want to make that point. It's, about the pace. it's not just about doing the right thing. About, I think it's about the pace of, of delivery. I want to say a little bit about the pathways, preferably before people get to the stage where they're overdosing on heroin, but the pathways uh, to, to recovery. Uh, and I want to talk about um, rehab beds. I know rehab beds are just one way to recovery. I saw an interesting comment on social media ahead of this afternoon's debate. It was a challenging one to the Scottish Government. The essence of the comment suggested that we should have research conducted into the impact of the fall in the number of rehabilitation beds and related services for those living with addiction. I've got a suggestion about how to conduct that research, Minister. Identify some key locations in Scotland, and yes, that should include Glasgow, and secure Additional rehab beds, yes, of course we need more. Let's ensure that these, these beds are fully funded. Let's work with those who deliver services and those with lived experience together to jointly agree a suitable referral pathway to allow those seeking recovery to secure those beds in the most sensitive and appropriate way. That's quite similar, actually, to what we're trying to do, revolutionary, hopefully, in relation to Housing First to provide all that wraparound support at the earliest point, if I have time, presiding officer. That's up to you, but you can't uh, go beyond six my, minutes. My apologies in that, in that case. Um, I, I think there is a political con consensus in this place, whether we put numbers on it or not, that we should see additional rehab beds. I think there is a political consensus in this place that we should see funding increases, even if we're not putting numbers on it necessarily. But I think that consensus does exist but the place we need consensus that political consensus is when the Scottish government sets its budgets and we all know the political reality in relation to that a minority government where deals and accommodations have to be made and I would say to my government but also to all the opposition parties in this place when those deals and accommodations are being made yes there will be lots of demands being made by every party that is the stuff of politics. But if there is going to be a national consensus on this, make the deal, the absolute deal, more money for addiction services and more money for rehab beds. But then don't find an excuse not to support the budget. Let's try and come together uh, as, as a parliament to, to do that. I'm really sorry that I don't, I, I don't have time. Um, I want to say a little bit about the, 
uh, advanced uh, drug treatment service uh, in Glasgow that, that, that's being started. Uh, another positive step, uh, up to 50 uh, people uh, who are drug addicts um, using medical grade heroin with uh, additional counselling support, housing support, uh, benefit support. Um, it's great that it's happening, but it's far too small. It is a drop in the ocean. Um, and I've not been part of political during this debate, I don't want to do it now, but that surely has to be a pre precursor to safe consumption rooms because turning up twice a day, seven days a week to part in that programme ain't going to happen for many, many vulnerable people. Let's build up the trust with those to sustain their drug use and get them into recovery by having, whether the powers are in this place or we get the approval of the UK government, let's just do it. Let's have a drug summit that looks to see what we can do in this place to improve the lives of those uh, whose lives have been blighted by drugs and also at a UK level. Let's come together and do that. In the 10 seconds I've got left, can we also have people from the faith-based community involved in the Drugs Death Summit? I think that's really, really important and I would suggest that the Reverend Brian Casey in Springbird would be well placed to provide and fulfil that role. Jenny Mara, followed by Fulton McGregor. Presiding officer, nobody thinks or is suggesting to the minister today that this problem is easy to solve. The minister and I come from the same city and we both know that this problem has been building up over many years and blighting the lives of people we grew up with and went to school with. I say this because people in our communities don't think there are easy answers to this problem either. But what they do know is that what is happening now is not working and we need to try different things. However, I think there is huge delay and I want to talk about that today. We can't deny the scale of the problem. Scotland has the highest drugs death rate in the world and no amount of hyperbole used in this chamber will ease the pain of mothers and fathers across Scotland watching their children's lives wasted away on these drugs. In August last year, the Dundee Drugs Commission published its report. It was a challenging report written by families and experts after lots of evidence and consideration. It published 10 immediate recommendations. Now, nearly six months later, not all, uh, but very few of these immediate recommendations have been implemented. I think there is initial progress on one. We hear work has started, but there are few concrete steps forward yet. And this is urgent because drugs workers in our city and across Scotland predict that the tally of deaths in Dundee and Scotland will rise again this year. Why have these recommendations not yet become reality? I believe after talking to drugs workers and commissioners in the city that the institutions that exist to treat and support drug users are not flexible enough and are lacking the leadership required to drive these changes through. For instance, one of the immediate recommendations in Dundee was to try to bring together the drugs and mental health services. But nobody has been appointed to oversee this work. How can this change happen if there is no one person tasked with driving that change? Now, we know the National Task Force is doing its work. But I have to ask the Minister today, is he not satisfied with some of the suggestions that have already come forward? For example, from the Dundee Drugs Commission, how long can we wait to start trying new things, new ways of working? How long must the conversation and analysis go on when much of it has been said already and people believe that there are workable solutions already on your desk, Minister? Let me give an example. Problem drug users in Dundee are referred to what is locally known as ISMS, the drug centre where patients are referred to a psychiatrist. The Minister already has evidence on his desk recommending that this high-tariff, expensive way of treating patients is not always necessary. And recommendations exist that more drugs workers on the ground, working with families in their homes, trying to encourage people into treatment, would be a more effective use of some of this money. No, I won't just now, sorry. Again, we have these 10 immediate recommendations from the Commission. What exactly are we waiting for? Because we don't have time to wait. And let me tell you why. A stark reminder just before Christmas for me. I heard about a young girl whose dad died of drugs in Dundee just before Christmas and she was taken into care. Unless we take radical action to stabilise the lives of men and women my age who have children, we will have more and more children 
left without parents in our city and across the country, and all the subsequent trauma and vulnerability to these children's lives and the vulnerability to addiction for themselves that that brings. Presiding officer, it's been an important debating point and an important life-saving point in Dundee. So let me address the issue of same-day prescribing because I was interested to hear Shona Robinson say that has been fully implemented. That is not my understanding. Um, a small, my understanding is that a small and very small group of people are still part of a test for change. However, that test for change, the clinically qualified commissioner on the Dundee Drugs Commission said that was not necessary because the clinical evidence already existed. Indeed, some same-day prescribing happens already in Lothian. So at best, we have a huge and unnecessary delay to this life-saving policy in Dundee. Now, this small group of people who are involved in this allows the Dundee Partnership to say they are, having the they are making the changes required. Whereas the Drugs Commission said clearly to the Minister that the real change will come when faster access is achieved, when same-day prescribing is available right across the city, when GPs are involved. None of that is happening now. And when people can get treatment within two, three or four days, exactly as Michelle Ballantyne says, when they present and are willing to go into treatment rather than the weeks and months that the majority of people in Dundee have to wait. Presiding officer, can I take the opportunity today to recognise the work that my colleague Monica Lennon has done on the delays to toxicology reports? She tells us about the heartache to the families, and that is the most important point. But another consequence of those delays is that police can't track day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week trends in drug consumptions on our streets and in our homes, so they can know and prevent what is happening. And I think that is something that we must consider too. Presiding officer, my remarks today have focused on the delay and continual conversations that I think are delaying much needed action. I would urge the minister to do an assessment on Monday morning on his desk of all the re recommendations he has already received and really just try and get on with some of them. And minister, can we please have more debating time on this in the chamber. We have not even scratched the surface of drugs today, and we have given a very small amount close, of time please. to alcohol. We need at least a month to debate this, so a week would be very welcome. We have to be very tight on the last two contributions. Please, Fultz McGregor and Emma Harper. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, I, I welcome the government bringing... Thank you, Fix your Officer. microphone, please. Um, yeah, you have. I welcome the government bringing forward this debate because, as we've already heard today, there is no ignoring that we continue to face a public health emergency in Scotland. Drug-related deaths in Scotland saw a 27% rise in 2018, a number that has more than doubled in the last five years. And let's be honest, we must also take into account that this number likely misses many deaths from suicide, from illness or infection that may be related to drug use. However, I do feel that I can confidently stand here today and say that this Scottish Government takes the problem seriously. We're hearing that and has undertaken a wide range of actions to address this issue and ultimately decrease the amount of drug-related deaths. As has already been mentioned, a dedicated task force has been set up in order to recommend steps that will reduce the harms caused by the drugs. And I'm delighted that the Scottish Government have invested almost £800 million to tackle problem alcohol and drug use since 2008. And I'd like to highlight the importance of the Scottish Affairs Committee report, a report that strongly suggests that we should amend law to allow a range of public health focused responses. It outlines evidence that the UK Government's current approach to drugs is not evidence based and therefore ineffective. The Scottish Government will continue to urge this out of touch Tory UK Government to take action as quickly as possible and provide the most adequate solution for this problem, which is devolving power to Scotland, not at the moment, eh, Mr. Bell. The UK Government routinely accepts recommendations in favour of tightening drug law, but rejects those in favour of liberalisation. Drug abuse is not simply a criminal justice matter. There is an array of evidence that criminal justice sanctions are counterproductive. Indeed, presiding officer, I've spoke before about my own experience as a social worker, and I worked in the criminal justice sector for some time, and that, that is my experience. Hey, office, I think we need to take a health-based approach. And one of the most important and simple steps that the UK Government can take right away to reduce harm is to end austerity. Really quite simple. I know that Brian Whittle, and I respect exactly where he's coming from, and I know that Brian Whittle always um, 
puts forward a very uh, measured debate and response, but he did say that we should be looking at this on a non-political basis, but I don't see how we can do that. You know, austerity is at the root of, of much of this, and given that I've mentioned, Mr Whittle will take an intervention. Brian Whittle. Can I thank Paul McGregor for, for taking that intervention. If we're going to bring politics into this, can, we, can, we, can you explain to me why the same rules apply across the whole of the United Kingdom, yet in Scotland you're three times more likely to die from, from uh, uh, drug issues than you are in the rest of the United Kingdom? How can that possibly be laid at the feet of Westminster? It's, it's time to take control of it up here. Fulton McGregor. I, I didn't say that it was all laid at the feet of Westminster. I said that austerity is having a major impact. And what I would say to that is that austerity has a worse and a more disproportionate impact on our communities in Scotland than it does in other parts of the UK. And that is perhaps what is leading to the figures that, that you're suggesting there. Because I think that that is one of the things that we can, we can do right now or that the UK government can do right now. Also, we've already heard um, from many speakers today there's overwhelming evidence that, uh, you know, that places where people can consume drugs in a safe environment with sterile equipment while being supervised by medical staff are proven, are proven to reduce overdoses uh, and lower rates of infection. And I, again, I think it's shocking that the UK government continue to block this with places like Bob Doris's constituency in Glasgow, and we've heard a lot about Dundee, continue to suffer despite overwhelming evidence that similar facilities in Portugal, Germany and Canada can reduce the amount of drug-related deaths. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take one from behind me then. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Uh, are we having a double act here? Make up your mind, please, Mr McGregor. Yep. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank uh, Philip McGregor for taking intervention, and uh, I would uh, make uh, the Chamber aware once again that I'm in, on the management board of moving on Inverclyde. But, uh, Mr McGregor, would you agree with Mr McGregor with me that um, one of the things that was commented on earlier by Miles Briggs was to actually have everything on the table to be discussed? However, as we've already heard from the Conservatives, sadly, that this is one particular policy that they don't want to have discussed, which sadly will continue to have a negative effect upon Scotland. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thanks very much. And I, I, do, I do agree with what my colleague, Mr McMillan, has said. Uh, everything needs to be on the table. And I think that that is the point that, that, that Mr Whittle's made. Um, turning locally, presiding officer, with the time I've got left, tomorrow I'll be visiting uh, the Lanarkshire Addiction and Recovery Team based in my constituency at Coat Hill Hospital in Coat Bridge. And I've heard great things about this new service and I'm looking forward to seeing the support this service offers to those in my constituency living with addiction. The service offers a range of interventions that supports people to make changes to their life that can improve their physical, mental and social wellbeing. And I think it's absolutely vital that we all support uh, these services to be the best they can be in tackling this issue that is so important to us. I also want to again mention the Minister and his officials will be sick of me mentioning uh, the fabulous REACH advocacy who are also based in my constituency just for some of the work that they do and I, I, and I had a lot more uh, to say about them here presiding officer but I, I do, I do realise that I'm running out of time but again an opportunity just to mention the fantastic work that they do in the, um, in the local area and actually across Scotland. Um, with the very limited time I've got left, I want to also say that we, I think we need to uh, look outside the box. And I looked to Monica Lennon uh, and her colleagues uh, in, the, in the Labour Party there were in, in the process in the Monklands area of um, getting a new hospital. But there's a discussion about what we can do with the current site. And what I would say to colleagues in the Labour Party is let's have a discussion about what we can do to meet uh, the needs of, that, of the area. Could we have a drug and alcohol rehabilitation type service? there where the, where the current hospital is, instead of focusing on oh, that, that, that the site should be for the new hospital. I think we really need to think outside the box. I'm not, I appreciate no, I mentioned Ms. your Lennon. name, but I'm not going to have time, and I, and I do apologise for that, because I did mention your name. Um, and on that note, side note, sir, I'll close. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, Ms Harper, I'm going to have to cut time off you. If you could give me five minutes, please. Thanks, President Officer. The joys of being last in the open debate. Um, too many fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters and our friends have lost their lives from uh, harm caused by drugs and alcohol. And I appreciate all the detail that many of the contributions so far uh, have made this afternoon from my colleagues across chamber. And I'm going to focus my contribution on some of the work that I've been involved in locally in Ayrshire, Dumfries and Galloway, and nationally as convener of, uh, Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Presiding Officer, Dumfries and Galloway is a large rural area which has many unique challenges in helping people affected by drug and alcohol addiction to access support. 
rural challenges need to be included in the future policy. I have met with Justin Murray, leader of the Drugs and Alcohol Service at Dumfries and Galloway um, in Lochside and Dumfries. I have met with him a few times now and we have discussed some of the challenges both for those living with addiction and his service that, that he faces and what could be done differently. And I was interested to hear that there are an estimated between 1,100 and 1,600 people who have problems with drug use among DNG's 148,000 residents. And while more people are accessing the drugs and alcohol service, um, there are a 30% drop in the number of needles handed out to these addiction services last year to the people with addiction. This means there are fewer people with uh, injecting heroin or other injectable drugs than in previous years. Justin is, mm -hmm. uh, he's done some research and he's indicated that many people are moving away from heroin and other injectable drugs in DNG and are changing the ways that they acquire substances um, like contacting their local dealer who would then either meet them or deliver the drugs via a taxi. And many are now ordering their illicit substances online, on social media, on the dark web, and then having the pills, including Xanax, which is a powerful benzodiazepine tranquilizer, they're having them delivered to their front door by mail. Information released from BBC Scotland shows how significant this issue is. The investigation showed that there were 70 death certificates of people in the southwest of Scotland where controlled substances were recorded as the cause of death between 2012 and 2017, whereas heroin and opiate as a cause of death as uh, recorded on the death certificate in 51 uh, people across the region. So it, it's interesting to see the difference in the statistics. The real worry for Justin, um, and I would therefore ask the Minister for reassurance, that people suffering from addiction in rural locations, such as the South West, are absolutely on the government's radar and will be looked at as part of the new addiction pathway. Presiding officer, last year, along with Health and Sport Committee colleagues Dave Stewart and Brian Whittle, I was able to take part in the Westminster Scottish Affairs Committee's inquiry into drug deaths in Scotland. The inquiry had two key aims. One was to better understand the causes and reasons for drug addiction and drug deaths in Scotland, and two, make recommendations on what action could be taken to better address drug deaths. The inquiry heard evidence from numerous experts across drug and alcohol services, clinicians, academics, counsellors, and those who have lived with addiction in the past. The committee's findings were unanimous and clear. In order to truly address the issue, there were a couple of recommendations based on international evidence also from Spain, France, Italy and Canada. And these include decriminalising small amounts of drugs for personal use, allowing the establishment of safe consumption rooms and importantly, treating drug addiction as a public health issue and not a criminal issue. I would encourage members to read the inquiry report because it was helpful for me I want to also briefly mention a project that I've been working closely with in my South Scotland region. River Garden, I'm sorry I don't have time because I now have five minutes because members went over. River Garden at Auchincroove near Ayr is a really important place that has been established. I visited it with the minister last year and I'll be seeing them again soon. They have a great example of how tackling uh, drugs and alcohol and help uh, people experiencing harm. Uh, they help them by engaging in a programme where the residents start a three-month programme that becomes a three-year programme and they're provided with accommodation and a job and pay. The residents live on site, they work, they plant seeds, they grow their own fruit and vegetables and they nurture them through the seasons and that's really important. And then they use the vegetables and the fruit on the on-site cafe which is open to the public and that helps reduce stigma. And I know members, Alison Johnston has mentioned uh, the stigma associated with uh, drugs and alcohol today. The whole place is supportive of a model that is effective for recovery. And the evidence has shown that comparing to the San Padre Nano in Italy, this is worth continuing to support. So, presiding officer, I know I'm out of time, so I want to thank the government to, for pursuing this and taking action, and I look forward to the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for cutting down, and time is very tight in the closing speeches. First of all, I call Alex Cole Hamilton for no more than six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this has been a very full debate with a lot of empirical evidence, a lot of suggestion, and indeed a lot of consensus across the Chamber. That is unsurprising because it has been seven years since the Government last used its time 
to debate this crisis, this absolute human crisis in our public health sector. I just, I will. Neil Finlay. Um, since it, uh, so that we don't have to wait another seven years for another government debating it, does he agree with me, and maybe the Minister can uh, refer to this in his summing up, that we should have an annual debate on the publication of the drug death statistics, and that would come in government time? Alex Cole Hamilton. Can I thank uh, Mr Finlay for intervening with what I believe to be an exceptional idea and certainly something I would like to associate myself and my party with, so I'm grateful for that. Can I start by addressing my amendment? I apologise for not moving it properly, uh, Deputy Pre Presiding Officer. I know the government is nervous about the precise wording of my amendment in relation to the section on diverting people caught with drugs for personal use into treatment and avoiding them going to prison. I want to say to the Minister, it's not my intention, nor do I believe it is to step on the toes of uh, the Lord Advocate. It's not my intention either for the amendment to be prescriptive about how we do that, how we achieve this new policy position. And I don't think uh, we should need to interpret it like that. But what it needs first, and what we've still yet to receive, is this government's political support for the policy and the principle of diversion. It would, after all, require the government to say that they back this new approach to people caught with drugs for personal use. It would also require ministers to ensure that diversion services are in place. That's the treatment and education that people would receive instead of going to prison. Section 12 of the 1985 Criminal Procedure Act says that the Lord Advocate can issue guidance to police officers about how they deal with such situations, but surely he won't do so without guarantees about other alternative support services, or indeed without ministers having voiced their support. That is the intention of our, our amendment today, and I ask government to support it. The minister's opening remarks were wide-ranging. He covered in granular detail uh, the role of the task force. Now, I, Deputy Presiding Officer, met with Professor Katrina Matheson. I have no doubt of her credentials, nor do I doubt her passion. What I am anxious about, though, is that this government will not act on the recommendations that the task force delivers. And I would ask that the minister make a cast iron commitment that insofar as it is possible within the competence of this parliament to do so, it will action the evidence of the expert task force it has established. I'm grateful for, to Miles Briggs for developing the argument about the link between childhood trauma drug and alcohol use in later life. They are inexorably linked. And what's more, presiding officer, we know that nobody is beyond hope of healing from those, even elderly residents, elderly citizens, traumatized and damaged by events even half a century ago, can be helped to heal. So I echo his comments about the need for investment around this debate in child and adolescent mental health and in adult psychiatric services as well. Monica Lennon was right to link the drugs death crisis to the HIV epidemic that started in Glasgow in 2015 and is still growing, just at a time when these vulnerable groups were facing a, an outbreak of a horrific and highly contagious infection. This government was cutting the funding to the services they enjoyed that were fighting to keep them alive. HIV is just one of the comorbidities associated with intravenous drug use and I'm very grateful to Alison Johnson for raising the prevalence of undetected hepatitis C in our drug using population. It's incumbent on all of us to get people to come forward, to get tested and into treatment. It need not be a life sentence. Presiding officer, if you will recall, I intervened on Shona Robinson in her speech. I have to admit it was a, a very well delivered speech and from the heart I know that her community more than most is suffering as a result of this crisis. But I was dismayed that even now, some two years after she left ministerial office, she can't accept the damage that a budget cut that amounted to a quarter of all funding has caused. She stated that we need to identify what works and then fund accordingly. Presiding officer, it's hard to identify what works when a third of your staff are on notification of redundancy. We have had some several helpful suggestions in this debate. Brian Whittle's suggestion of a mobile pharmacy, I think, bears some further consideration. And Neil Finlay made a very important point about linking up police, community and public health funding to bring them together in the same space so we're all working in the same direction. Mr Finlay spoke with typical passion on an issue that he and I have worked closely together on these past four years. His, indigna his indignation in his speech was righteous and it was evidence-based and he was absolutely right to move the debate also on to the issue of benzodiazepines and barbiturate prescribing. I share his 
perspective on the abject health inequality attached to this issue. It is a health inequality. I have some common ground with Michelle Ballantyne on the issue of being parked on methadone. It, it can be a twilight world. It's a, a short-term solution for stabilization, but it can become a life sentence. Presiding officer, I'll close by with saying this. If we are to answer the challenge spelled out to us by Jenny Mara, again, an MSP who's worked tirelessly on this issue for her constituents who are blighted by this perhaps more than most, the, reality, and the challenge she laid out, and the, the reality that drug deaths are likely to rise year on year without further action, then we cannot wait another seven years for a debate like this. Thank you. Thank you. Monica Lane, in six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think we all agree that the time today has been quite limited and we do need to have a further discussion like this very, very soon. In reflecting on today's debate, I think we all agree that actions speak louder than words. But there is a word that I think needs to be said. It, it was sort of missing today, and that word is sorry. Sorry that we didn't respond to the, the pain and despair and hopelessness of your mother, your father, husband, wife, partner, son, daughter, brother, sister, grandchild, or friend. Some people have lost multiple of those people. Sorry that we didn't see you or listen when you were desperate for our attention, when you were searching for that fast track into treatment, for a safe place that is free from judgment and stigma, for your rights to be respected. Sorry that we scored points while you count the dead. Collectively, we didn't act on the warnings. And this led to confirmation last summer that Scotland now has the highest rate of drug-related deaths in the world, whilst alcohol-related deaths remain at historically high levels, an issue we've not had enough time to discuss fully today. So as has been said by everyone in the chamber, we need urgent, nationally coordinated action that will help lead to an immediate reduction and the devastation being heaped upon thousands of Scottish families each year. Jenny Mara is right, the recommendations are sitting on the Minister's desk, but the same also applies to UK Ministers. Announcements in recent days, particularly on the lock zone, are positive. Overall, however, we are light on action and delivery. Outcomes are not improving. We've heard members talk about their own areas. Ruth McGuire talked about rising drug deaths in, in North Ayrshire. But we are seeing pockets of, of strong leadership. Um, like North Ayrshire, where I pay tribute to Councillor <coughs> Louise McFater, who's sitting in the gallery for her drive and for her courage. Sadly, Louise lost her beloved sister to a drug-related death. And together with Councillor Joe Cullinane, and indeed the full council in North Ayrshire, they're giving serious attention to preventing and reducing drug harm in their community. And Bob Doris mentioned Reverend Brian Casey, um, who welcomed many of us to Springburn Parish Church in Bob Doris's constituency. Um, I think your um, request or recommendation to the Minister about involving Reverend Casey in the, in the task force is, is a good one. That was a very poignant visit to, to Springburn. We walked through the streets on a Friday night um, with candles. I walked behind a group of um, mothers and grandmothers and later inside the church, you could see the, the grief and the worry and the loss etched into their faces. It is absolutely heartbreaking. And many colleagues did mention the importance of reducing alcohol harm. We heard from Kenneth Gibson, who's done a lot of work in this area. We heard from Alison Johnson. We had some good interventions from David Stewart to remind us that we do have a social responsibility levy sitting on the statute books. We should use that. And Jenny Mara with her suggestion on alcohol plain packaging. Um, Fulton McGregor, um, if we had more time, I know you couldn't take my intervention, but happy to consider anything in our area in Lanarkshire that can help people's lives. The immediate things that concern me in Lanarkshire is when I can't even get a, an out of hours emergency phone number for a family who are saying our son um, has been in hospital, he's attempted suicide and he's addicted to alcohol and street valium and we don't know what to do. And I had to sit in NHS Lanarkshire's headquarters for 40 minutes just to, to beg for a phone number. And because they're so overstretched, they were reluctant to even give an MSP that phone number in case I shared it with others. We can't be in this situation. 
So when I said earlier on that I'm frightened, this is why I'm frightened. Happy to take the quickly, please, Philip McGregor. Yeah, it's just on that point there. Um, I wonder if Monica Lennon will um, be like myself and, and be hopeful that the, the new uh, drug and alcohol service, which has been set up um, by NHS Lanarkshire, will help to alleviate some of those concerns which she has uh, experienced there on behalf of our constituents. Monica Lennon. I don't think there's any point of, of disagreement there, but I'm happy to speak to Fulton McGregor um, for longer after this. There's not a lot of time left. Um, I'm mindful that today is Young Carers Awareness Day. We've talked about families. We have to talk more about the impact on, on young people, um, particularly young people who maybe are at home caring for for relatives who have alcohol-related brain injury, a, a, an issue where there's very little awareness. And I, I made a point earlier about the, the, the entire Scottish Government, the entire Cabinet. I would have liked to see ministers here today who have responsibility for, for education, for housing, for communities, for justice, for finance. It can't just be left to the health team alone. I, I really do believe that, because if we're genuine about trauma-informed responses, genuine about understanding adverse childhood experiences, then we have to have that joined up approach. I welcome some of the, the progress and positive um, um, reports that have been made. I think Brian Whittle said, let's keep the political posturing out of it. I agree, but this is about political choices and we can't escape that. I don't yet have my invite to the UK wide summit that's coming to Glasgow. I don't know if anyone has an invite, but I think we all want to be there. So perhaps the Bureau could suspend Parliament that day so that we can be there with as many of our constituents as possible. We must take action and we must do it now. Annie Wells, six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I've listened to all of the contributions in this debate and I'm glad we're finally taking the time about, to talk about drug deaths at length in the Parliament. Some people in here have said we don't have the powers to tackle drug deaths. Out there, in the real world, some people will say we don't have the will. And no wonder, the power of this Parliament has not been used. Favour Scotland started a campaign with a very simple message. You keep talking, we keep dying. The message is bold, it's powerful, it's in your face, and it's absolutely spot on. That phrase should make everyone stop and pause. 1,187 people died in 2018. And who knows when we'll find out how many have died in 2019. I can walk along my street and point point out houses where families have been torn apart by drugs. When I've gone to events organised by Favour in Springburn or Postal, I have felt so humbled standing in those rooms, knowing that I have even the tiniest opportunity to change things. We've got to use the powers we have as MSPs to make a difference here and now. This Parliament can act. We can give that hope. If we all agree on rehab beds and we don't vote for them, people should never forgive us. So does anyone in this chamber think we shouldn't provide more rehab beds? And I will happily take an intervention on that point. Yes, absolutely. Me. <laughs> Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to Annie Wells, my mic on. I'm grateful to Annie Wells for giving way. I think we all want to see um, further um, capacity and investment in residential rehab. The difficulty, and I explained it at the start, why we can't support your amendment is that you have brought politics into that and you have put in a red line. You've deleted a very substantial part of the government in motion because you don't want to look at the responsibility of the UK government. And I don't think that is the right way to approach this. We will continue to argue and make the case for that additional funding. It might actually need to be more than 15.4 million. So we don't want to take any lectures on that point. Annie Wells. I, um, I would say I was grateful for that intervention, but actually I'm, I'm quite disappointed at that intervention. Um, I don't see why we all can't agree on this. And I will come to the other points that you've made at the end of my statement. No, no, I won't. I need to make progress. Thank you. The, the, 
The amendment itself does call for money and rehab beds, that's it. And if we can't unite to back that, I'm honestly at a loss. Are we going to sit here and pretend to be a parliament or are we going to act like one? We can go round in circles on some of, on some of these other issues. And I've heard members today and from several parties talk about decriminalisation. Many of the contributions are sincere, but with the same sincerity, I've got to say, when I hear that decriminalisation and consumption rooms are the only solution, and we've got to wait for the UK government's approval because nothing else will work, it doesn't confuse me, it angers me. That's all I've heard. That is all I have heard. Because 12... No, I won't take an intervention, thank you. 12 years ago, half the number of people died. Half. Even then, it was too many. But it's got worse. Something has gone wrong in this last decade. And it's been even worse in Scotland than anywhere else in the UK. So what has changed? It's not decriminalisation. We didn't have that a decade ago. It's not consumption rooms. We didn't have them either. But we did have hundreds and hundreds of rehab beds. There's only 14 beds in Glasgow now. Across Scotland, there's less than 70. 70 across Scotland. Those beds are gone, and it is this government's responsibility. I have been open, and I don't think decriminalisation and consumption rooms are the right solution. But, 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 even if you do think that that's the solution, they will only work if we have high quality treatment and rehab. The government seems to think we can set up a consumption in Glasgow and forget, shift the people with addiction out of sight, and it will look like they've done something, job done. You could put 100 consumption rooms on every corner from Govan Hill to Springburn, but if there's no residential rehab beds, and there are practically none, if there She's are people the being turned away from closing. rehab, and they are, then it won't matter how many consumption rooms we have, because without treatment and rehab services, nothing will change. So, rehab does work. I've got one last comment to make, uh, Deputy President Officer. Just last week, a mother wrote to me, and she said, I have a son who entered rehabilitation in Greenock at Jericho House. His addiction ripped my family apart, and if I had not found Jericho, I believe he would be dead. It is a travesty that a centre like this is being ignored by the Scottish Government. And if you're not prepared you to vote close. for more money for rehab beds today, then I hope that you're prepared to tell that mother why. I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to wind up the debate. If you could take us to decision time, okay, thank, please, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I um, start by thanking members across the chamber for, um, I, I think, a, a very good debate. Um, uh, it was um, a debate where members from across the chamber brought a range of topics, which um, many of which I will try to respond to. Uh, but before I do that, I want to. Um, touch on one of the areas I didn't manage to cover in my opening in terms of, of announcements about work that is, is ongoing and a, a few members talked about prevention in, 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 in their contributions. Um, within our um, strategies we made a commitment to improving our helpline uh, services for alcohol and, and drugs and this week um, we are introducing an improved way to offer more direct help to people who call our alcohol and drug helplines drink line uh, know the score. So from February the 1st, the service will be operated by Adaction Scotland on our behalf. That new service will build on their existing web chat services, which has already been up and running in some parts of the country. We know that more people engage with web chat services than phone services, and that the, uh, the, the offer of immediate links to services through web chat will greatly increase the access to services which everyone deserves. I think um, Adaction will be an organisation that many in the chamber know, so I, I hope people across, across the chamber welcome the, that um, development. Um, of course. Neil Finlay. A specific point before he moves on to address the debate. Um, I, I made the suggestion to Alec Cole Hamilton that we have an annual debate 
in Parliament when the drugs and alcohol statistics are published. The Minister's um, boss is next to him. Could we get confirmation whether that will happen? And if not, will we, con will we confirm that he will write to all members once he has seriously taken uh, consideration of that suggestion? Joe Fitzpatrick. So, so um, the member will be well aware that it is for the Parliamentary Bureau, not for me or for the Cabinet Secretary, to decide what business is debated in the, in the Chamber. I want to I um, start in addressing some of the, the topics which were discussed, um, particularly from, from the amendments. Um, so I'll, I'm going to start with um, uh, the, the Labour amendment in the name of Monica Lennon. And there's kind of two, two main parts to that. While I, I, I cannot agree with the, the, the final conclusions in relation to budget um, that's in that amendment, um, people... The, the rest of the amendment, which talks about the impact on, in relation to toxicology, if, if, if I could finish, if I, if I can finish um, explaining uh, my approach. The other, the other points in, in relation to toxicology, I think, are really, really important. So I am not going to stand here and argue about budget lines from four or five years ago when people are dying today. So the government will be supporting the Labour amendment because the other points which are made in that amendment in relation to, um, in, in relation to toxicology and uh, other matters, and in fact, the, the point um, up to protecting uh, budget is, I think, really, really important. Monica Lennon. I'm glad the Minister has confirmed that the Government will support the amendment and as I made um, my remarks in opening, it's not about looking back to, to apportion any blame or to point fingers, but it's to make sure that we never make decisions like that again where we underfund those critical services and then have to come here and debate the fact that we have the highest record of drug-related deaths in the world. Joe Fitzpatrick. As I say, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and, and have that debate because there was a number of really important points that were made throughout the, the discussion that I want to, to focus on. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll try and spend some time answering some of those points. Miles Briggs and the Conservatives made a point about um, residential rehab. And, and I, I've, I've made the point that I am not closed to, to that, that suggestion. Um, I, I made the point in my opening remarks that we are currently mapping out what provision that is available um, and, and what demand there is for those services. <laughs> it is really important that we, we use our resources in ways that will, will work and deliver. Miles Briggs mentioned the, the service in, in, in uh, Clyde, Clyde, Clyde Bank, um, and, and I think that is a, a really good example of really good value uh, residential rehabilitation. There's also, I, I think, a really good service in here in Edinburgh, the, the LEAP project, where it's an NHS service provided. And then we need to look at the, the various models uh, across Scotland, including the Phoenix in Glasgow, actually, which I, I hope to visit soon, um, to, to make sure that if we are spending money on, on these services, that the demand is actually there, and that's what people want, and it's not what people are being told to want. Miles Briggs. I thank the Minister for taking this intervention. The problem is we've seen such a dramatic loss of this service, only 70 beds now available across this whole country. You know, we need to see these put back, and that's going to take action. I warned ministers two years ago that we needed to stop seeing the loss of these beds. That's what this amendment I'm bringing today can achieve. We need to fund them, and we need to fund them from today, not another feasibility study. Minister. What, what, what the Conservative amendment does not recognise is that there has been a reshaping of, of um, services ac across Scotland. And, and when those services are being reshaped, I think it's absolutely imperative that it is done with the involvement of the service users. And that is what has happened in Glasgow. So there's been some criticism of the changes in Glasgow, but they've been driven by the people who want to use those services. But that said, and while it is for local um, ADPs to, to look at the services that are provided in their area and the demand in their area, the Scottish Government is looking to map out what provisions are available across Scotland, what are they, I think Bob Doris talked about the, the pathways into, into those services to make sure they are available. Presiding officer, we've kind of rushed through in terms of these interventions, have taken so much time, it's difficult for, for me to um, respond to most of the points that are being made, it's, it's almost time. I do want to make a, a, a point in, in relation to the, the Reverend Brian Casey. I, I think the, the, the points that, that um, Bob Doris has made there and, and others about Brian Casey being involved in the UK Drugs, Drug Summit, I think is, is really important. Um, there's no, no questioning 
the Reverend's commitment to this area. And I, I think um, I, I've certainly called on the UK government to, to make sure that Brian Casey doesn't just have a role the Reverend Casey doesn't just have a role in the summit, but has a, a central role at the, at the start of the summit in order to put in, in context exactly why the summit is happening in Glasgow and, and, and in terms of, of that, that human tragedy that exists there. So I hope they accept that, um, that suggestion. I am um, obviously was um, surprised at the, the, the approach that was taken in bringing forward that summit and the way it was announced, but I have made clear to the UK Government that it is my determination to work with anyone on this matter that will help us to get to a point of saving lives, and so that is what we are doing, and that's what is happening across Scotland, and the Drugs Death Task Force is leading that work. Thank you very much, Minister, and that concludes our debate on drugs and alcohol preventing and reducing harms. The next item is consideration of Motion 20662 on a financial resolution for the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Bill. And could I call on Derek Mackay to move this motion? Moved. Thank you very much. We're going to turn now to decision time. There are five questions. And the first, uh, on the first question, I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Miles Briggs is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton will fall. The first question is that amendment 20635.1 in the name of Miles Briggs which seeks to amend motion 20635 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on drugs and alcohol preventing and reducing harms be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 20635.1 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes, 28, no, 86. There were no abstentions. The motion, the amendment, sorry, is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 20635.3 in the name of Monica Lennon, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is the amendment 20635.2 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 20635.2 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes, 20, no, 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 20635 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick as amended on drugs and alcohol preventing and reducing harms be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may vote now. The result of the vote on motion 20635 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick as amended is yes, 86, no, 28. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. 
And our final question is that motion 20662 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes decision time. I close this meeting.